On May 24th, there were very few people who knew the name George Floyd. That name is now known to hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people. His death on May 25th sparked protests which quickly turned violent on May 26th. It's June 3rd, and we've seen nationwide rioting in America's cities. Legitimate, peaceful protesting is being subverted into mass destruction. America is burning. I can't let that happen without saying something about all of it. I don't want to fan the flames, but this has to be said, and I don't care who gets angry. First, and most importantly, George Floyd should not have died. The police officers who made the arrest should all be charged with his death, not just the guy who knelt on his neck. There were three other cops there. Why didn't they stop Derek Chauvin, especially when Floyd said that he couldn't breathe? This was the match which lit the fuse to a powder keg in every city. Americans protested this brutality just as they should. Peaceful protests continued over the following days, or at least they tried to be peaceful. Some succeeded, and some didn't. I'm encouraged by the peaceful protests, especially in the instances where the protesters and the cops have come together to raise these concerns safely and demand change, and to heal a little from a long history of pain. This image is from Ferguson, Missouri, the city where Michael Brown was killed in 2014. It's not the only place where cops and citizens are standing together against police brutality, either. Unfortunately, there was and is a small but vocal group who are actively encouraging protesters to turn violent. This isn't an opinion, it's fact. This woman told off a group of people in a car for handing out bricks, saying that they were going to get someone killed. There was a lot of active planning going on with these riots, too. Bottles filled with gasoline were hidden in bushes all over Minneapolis after the rioting had started, in preparation for further arson. A crate of pipe bombs was found by the Korean War Memorial on the National Mall. Buildings, including some which are historical landmarks, were set on fire. Monuments were defaced, including the World War II Memorial just six days after Memorial Day and the Lincoln Memorial. Stores were smashed and looted. Some were burned to the ground. But property crimes are nothing compared to crimes against people. This elderly shop owner was beaten while begging looters to leave her store alone. This man was shot in the head with a tear gas canister. People are dying, both protesters and police alike. The rioting has become so extensive that the National Guard has been called up to assist the police in many states. The president is also threatening to invoke the Insurrection Act of 1807 so that active duty military personnel can intervene if the states cannot get these riots under control. Yet still, people on both sides of the argument are making the most inflammatory statements, fanning the flames as if that will solve the problem but it won't. Burning down American cities won't solve this problem. Breaking down law and order in America won't solve a problem with law and order. I've cited a lot of law in my recent videos. This one will be no different. Let's start at the top. The First Amendment protects the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition for redress of grievances. That's protesting right there, enshrined in the Constitution. Like all First Amendment rights, though, it's not an absolute right. What are you talking about, Roast? The First Amendment is paramount. The government cannot shut down those rights. Yes, it can. The freedom of speech is not absolute because speech which incites an imminent threat of violence or criminal activity is not protected. The freedom of the press is not absolute for the same reason. The freedom of religion does not protect religious practices which cause harm. And when assembling freely and petitioning for redress of grievances, this same standard applies. Assemblies cannot happen if they cannot be peaceful. Most cities require a permit for protesting and political rallies specifically because of the potential for fighting and other violence, and they position police and other emergency services to respond quickly as needed to preserve the peace and safety of those who are at the protest, demonstrators, counter-demonstrators, and passers-by alike. When the protest turns violent, the authorities have the duty to disperse the crowds as peacefully as possible. If the crowds refuse to disperse, then the authorities have the duty to detain those disturbing the peace. If the crowd becomes violent, then the authorities have to escalate their response. That's how we get to the Insurrection Act being invoked. Mass looting, arson, and assaults have to be stopped. 
That's part of the social contract which has been codified into law in America. As a veteran, I don't like it when the military has to be summoned to deal with rioting. The average soldier might just agree with protesting a particular issue and understand their anger. But there's understanding and there's duty. The military doesn't have the right to support rioting. They don't have the right to refuse orders to quell riots either. Article 94 of the UCMJ, which is codified in 10 U.S.C. 894 for those who care, specifically defines mutiny and sedition as capital offenses. Article 85, 10 U.S.C. 885, prohibits desertion. Article 90, 10 U.S.C. 890, prohibits willful disobedience of a lawful order. Soldiers cannot refuse their duty. Their only defense when refusing orders is to challenge the legality of those orders. They cannot refuse to work the riots if ordered to do so, and they cannot talk with each other about not obeying those orders. They also cannot actively participate in a riot, nor can they just go home. All of these actions can and will result in a court-martial, and depending on the level to which the soldiers resist their orders, can result in a severe sentence. And just to point out a little detail, I wish people would stop asking soldiers to kneel in solidarity. Soldiers, while they are wearing their uniform, are expressly forbidden by military regulation from making any political statements. They represent the government of the United States, and because of that, their speech is limited. Don't think that civilians are safe from punishment either. If a person says that they support the rioters, the Supreme Court has ruled that statement to be protected speech. However, publishing anything which advocates the overthrow of the government at any level by force is seditious libel under 18 U.S.C. 2385. If two or more people plan to overthrow the government at any level, it's seditious conspiracy under 18 U.S.C. 2384. Both of these crimes carry a sentence of up to 20 years, and they aren't the only offenses contained within Chapter 115 of Title 18 U.S.C. If anyone is involved in such activities, be they Antifa or white supremacists or Aunt Mabel's gardening club, they can be prosecuted for doing this. Government buildings have been attacked. The courthouse in Nashville springs to mind, as does the 3rd Precinct in Minneapolis. That's in addition to charges of terrorism, arson, and any other charges that the perpetrators may face for physical harm caused to others by setting those fires. There's been allegations that either Antifa or white supremacists have been involved in the rioting as instigators and escalators. I think that it's possible, given the fact that there are so many images of people who are actively joining the riots in what is obviously protective gear, that this is so. That smacks of planning to me, not spontaneity, and that would place those actions, if proven to the court's satisfaction, firmly in violation of 18 U.S.C. 2384, in my opinion. And speaking of Antifa, I have to correct a common misunderstanding. Antifa as an organization has its roots in the German Communist Party back during the Weimar Republic era, just as the SA was the direct action arm of the National Socialist Party, so Antifa was the direct action arm of the Communist Party of Germany. In the 1930s, the SA and Antifa fought each other in the streets of Germany during the collapse of the Weimar Republic, with Antifa forced underground in 1933. After the war, the Antifa movement reemerged as the modern version of Antifa. A common tenet of all Antifa groups, though, is that they consider capitalism and any other socio-political ideology that's to the right of anarcho-communism to be fascism, and they claim to be militantly anti-fascist. That makes Antifa a far-left extremist movement deliberately organized horizontally in small groups so as to avoid detection and prosecution for seditious conspiracy. William Barr declared Antifa to be a domestic terrorist organization on May 30th and ordered all 56 FBI anti-terrorism task forces to identify and arrest Antifa members. Given the fact that the ATTF has been monitoring Antifa since the 2016 elections due to their involvement in violent demonstrations, I expect that the FBI will respond pretty swiftly to these instructions. And indeed, the news reports seem to indicate that many arrests have been made. If it does happen to be white supremacist groups instigating the violence, then they are subject to the same consequences which Antifa is facing right now. There are a lot of people making this claim in the media, but I have to admit to some skepticism. First, numerous celebrities, including the Joe Biden presidential campaign, have donated to a fund to bail out those arrested during the riots. Would they be doing this if they believed that white supremacists were being arrested? Second, no less an authority on white supremacy than the Southern Poverty Law Center has disputed the allegation that white supremacists were the instigators of the riots. 
noting that white supremacy groups are not known for overt activity of this kind or for cooperating with Black Lives Matter and similar movements. BLM is helping to organize the protests, and no one can say that the SPLC is sympathetic to white supremacists. Yes, you caught me. I said protests, not riots. I don't believe that BLM wants people burning down neighborhoods and destroying businesses. BLM may have a bad relationship with the police, but they don't advocate for the destruction of property in general. Rather, they want what nearly everyone in America is demanding, an end to police brutality and a pervasive environment of fear and discrimination. There are a lot of people on social media making statements in support of the rioters. There are also people on social media who are condemning protesters and rioters alike. There are people blaming the riots on Donald Trump, and there are people blaming the riots on BLM, and people blaming the riots on whomever they can think of. None of these statements make a bit of sense to me, to be perfectly honest. Whomever is to blame, too many protests have become riots. The National Guard has been deployed, and now the active duty military may be deployed to put a stop to the rioting in support of the state and local police. It's gone too far for protesting at the moment, folks, and the sooner we realize this, the better. My recommendation to people who want to get out and protest the deaths of George Floyd and others at the hands of the police is to stay home for a little while while the riots are ended. Know that the vast majority of America agrees that Floyd was murdered and that justice must be served. Know that we, the citizens of the United States, want the scourge of police brutality ended too. We want to be able to trust our cops again, and the vast majority of police deplore brutality as much as you do. Bad cops like Floyd's killer make the job of every cop in America just that much harder to do. And even if there's only 1% of police that are engaging in police brutality and other dirty cop tactics, that makes more than 8,000 bad cops out there. Once the violence is over, we can get together to clean things up. While we sweep broken glass and pick up debris together, we can talk about how to fix this problem. We can discuss it, each of us trying to understand what the other is saying, disagreeing respectfully, and sharing our own stories. In the process, we might just discover that we have a lot more in common than we think we do. We might even discover a lasting solution to the original problem. I've always believed that such things are possible if people are willing to have rational conversations with each other. The alternative to working together is working against each other. And we've been doing that for far too long already. We are all Americans. This country belongs to all of us. The problems that America faces are our collective responsibility to solve. We can do this. It's time to listen to each other for once. It's time to stop seeing our fellow Americans as our enemies once and for all. But we have to end these riots. Lives are being destroyed. How many more must be destroyed before we will see reason?